I get a little bit nervous in an audience, so I actually brought my notes, so I hope you will bear with me and listen as I read through my notes. Today I want to talk with you about light therapy and the promising new findings from a recent complete, recently completed trial, which suggests robust efficacy for the treatment of bipolar depression and may have impl implications on future research which, which could extend our findings. But first I need to explain to you what is light therapy. Light therapy is a form of chronotherapy. Chronotherapy involves the management of psychiatric disorders or symptoms such as mood disorders and sleep disturbances with interventions that can modulate biological rhythms in order to improve symptoms and restore functioning. The intervention typically involves using a controlled exposure to stimulus such as bright light therapy or manipulation of sleep to change behavior and symptoms that are central and core to the current illness. So with, um, uh, with patients who have depression, especially patients who suffer seasonal affective disorder or winter depression, frequently they have disruptions in their circadian rhythms, which may contribute to or precipitate the onset of the depressive episode. In SAD, in seasonal affective disorder, patients have problems with delayed circadian rhythms which are not synchronized with external light dart cycles. Characteristic symptoms can include late bed and wake time, hypersomnia, excessive sleeping, low mood, poor energy, excessive appetite, weight gain, and low alertness levels. Circadian rhythms can also become disruptive when people travel across time zones and suffer jet lag. Um, when they are working shifts or, or shifting their shift schedule all the time. Um, if they've adopted a very late bed and wake time schedule, and also patients who um, are exposed to improper levels of high lighting in the late evening hours. For unipolar depression, mor morning light therapy, light therapy used in the morning is a first line treatment option, which doctors can prescribe. And um, by implementing light therapy, patients can advance their circadian phase, promote a, a change to earlier bed and wake time, which may help consolidate sleep and improve their mood symptoms. So how do patients do light therapy at home? Light therapy for SAD, or winter depression, involves using the use of bright light box in the morning at the time of awakening. The appropriate light box should emit a broad spectrum white light, which you can see here. My mentor, Ray Lamb, is seated in front of a light box. Um, the light box produces six to 10,000 lux of light. It produces a diffuse illumination to reduce glare. It's UV filtered, so it's safe for the eyes and won't burn the skin or your eye, um, your retina. Uh, people must be seated uh, 10 to 12 inches away, no further than 14 inches, placed on a, a stand so that the light is downward tilting and emitted in front of the person and not directly into their eyes or their face. The dose of light therapy begins with 30 minutes a day. The max dose is about 40 to 60 minutes. People can take many breaks and stretch, and it's important for doctors to talk with patients about how to incorporate it into their daily lives. Um, yeah. Bipolar disorder, we've discussed extensively the public health impact of bipolar disorder, and I've listed many here. Um, compelling reasons for extending our research into uh, novel treatments for for bipolar depression specifically. Why should we consider light therapy for bipolar disorder? Well, at, at the time when I sort of developed this, the study with my mentors um, at the University of Pittsburgh and also um, in New York, treatment interventions for depressed patients with bipolar disorder had not received um, enough research attention compared to the magnitude of the problem. Moreover, patients who have mood disorders um, appear to be exquisitely sensitive to light, to ambient light that is light in the environment. Reports include sun switches and mood polarity, rapid mood declines with changes in the season. Oftentimes, patients will experience a quick remission with increased sunlight from travel to southern climates or in the wintertime or even a brief trial of light therapy. This rapid effect of photic input can suggest altered processing of the visual or neural systems that would be unique to bipolar disorder. Moreover, the responsivity to light is taken um, as evidence that there might be uh, abnormalities in the circadian timing system so that patients may uh, gain more benefit and may be uniquely suited for light therapy. So um, mentor and I, Kathy Wisner, we examined <clears throat> so I have 
to. Uh, so for the state of reasons, we conducted a um, dose finding preliminary safety and efficacy study uh, in women only. And we modeled the study design the way we would uh, study drug efficacy with a novel drug agent. We included patients who were taking a mood stabilizer who did not have any hypomania or mixed symptoms and no problems with rapid cycling. And what we did was as follows. Let me show you what it looks like here. Um, the patients who we enrolled were started on morning light therapy. And the morning light therapy included a, um, a two-week placebo run-in phase where patients received a placebo comparator. And I used pink to outline this because it was actually dim red light. I should probably not disclose too much. But it was um, a sufficient placebo uh, comparator that allowed for some patients to gain a little bit of mood improvement for the first two weeks, but not sufficient response. Then they started on the morning light therapy. We started them on a judicious dose of 15 minutes a day, and they used this for a period of daily um, for a period of a week. And what happened was remarkable. Rather than starting to see improvement, we actually induced problems. We induced problematic mood switches. Patients who started out fully depressed, no mania or hypomania, developed quickly mixed or manic symptoms within the first days to the first two weeks of light therapy. Three out of the four first patients had this problem. One out of four had a full response within the first few weeks. So we were very surprised, um, concerned. We actually had to stop the study. Uh, this rapid onset of destabilizing mood effect was, you know, posed a potential safety risk. Um, we stopped the study. We um, careful discussion ensued with experts around the world in in the U.S. and Canada. And we found that literature that suggested cases of patients with uh, rapid cycling illness who actually improved with midday light therapy. We considered other options in, a, in changing the study protocol, but we opted for the simple solution, which is to move the timing of the light to midday. And what happened with that was also remarkable. Oh, shoot. Okay. So you see here the patients now, rather than just one gold star, the next three patients out of the three, or actually the next um, uh, series of patients that we enrolled, in fact, were able to experience um, a robust response to the light therapy. By moving the timing of the light from morning to midday, a time period between noon and two o'clock, um, for a duration of 15 to 45 minutes daily, we found that four out of the nine patients were able to gain a full response, and two out of nine gained partial response. This really intrigued us, and it suggested that maybe light, res the response to light is actually independent of um, the circadian timing system. So building on the data, we carried a confirmatory trial. The next step after preliminary safety trial is to examine this um, in a randomized control trial setting. What this means is that we received a grant to support the investigation of a comparator, a double-blind placebo-controlled trial. And the primary was to, aim was to compare the response to midnight, midday light therapy with response to an inactive comparator, which we used um, in the first trial. We enrolled adult men and women who had a current episode of depression or were on a proper mood stabilizer. The inactive comparator light box looked exactly like the active one, and we hoped that both, patients had, both groups of patients had the same expectations from the study treatment. And here is a summary of how we designed the protocol, and it's, it's very detailed, but ultimately what this means is that the eligible patients were prescribed midday light as indicated in the protocol. We had participants dis dispense the light. We dispensed the light box to study participants. They were instructed to use the light box daily in their own home, beginning with a starting dose of the 15 minutes. Each week, the light dose was carefully titrated according to their treatment response, meaning their mood improvement, no evidence of hypomania, and minimal side effects. The goal was to reach 60 minutes a day by week four. We attached little hoboware monitors in the back of the boxes to ensure that we could monitor patients' adherence to using the box, and for the most part, the majority of patients, 90% or more, use the box properly. 
We examine mood levels with the SIADS um, depression rating scale. That is the Hamilton depression rating scale with an atypical supplement. We assess for mania with the mania rating scale. We assess for suicidality. We assess for side effects. Also, sleep quality and functioning. And what did we find? The findings were, uh, so this is, this is the, an example of, our, of the effort that goes into a study. I don't know if you can read the small print in the little chart, but we actually phone screened um, almost, almost 1,000 people. And we actually brought in 90 patients. We excluded a bunch of patients who had rapid cycling, hypomania, a mild depression. We randomized 46 people. Most, um, more than 50% um, were female. And you can see the racial um, breakdown of the, of the patients. <clears throat> And what do the patients look like at baseline? Well, we had more representation from patients that had type 1 bipolar versus type 2 might reflect the severity of illness. Uh, many of the patients suffered bipolar episodes that they may or may not have been aware of at, as young as age 16. Um, many had years of illness. Many had other comorbid medical disorders. Their depression ratings were high. When we brought in the patients, um, these 46 patients, had um, levels of depression that indicated moderately severe to severe. None of them came in with mild or moderate levels of depression. They were very sick. Many had only 50% of functional being able to function compared to their baseline. So weekly, we measured their, their outcome. We, weekly, we assessed for um, how well they did. But I, I wanted to share with you what happened at the end and skip I actually haven't finished analyzing the data on what happened on a weekly basis because I, I think that's very important, but we'll just jump to the conclusion of what happened. So at week six, when the study had finished, the active phase of the study had finished, this is what we found. Among the two groups of patients, we had um, started with 46 and we finished with 39 patients. Um, majority of patients were able to complete the trial, but definitely the two groups differed um, be, um, significantly on several important measures that we looked at. When we looked at the um, depression levels, patients who had started out with side scores of 30 or more were now down to 10 in the second group and scores of 17 in the, in the um, first group. And I'm presenting to you the information as group X and Y because I'm still running a study in a blinded way. I don't want to taint the results as I am one of the um, evaluators. But what this really suggests is that patients who started out with moderately severe depression, who you were able to use the active light therapy on a daily basis, the majority of them were actually able to gain significant benefit and their depression levels dropped from moderately to se severe down to mi mild or minimal levels of depression. In fact, looking at the rates of remission, remission means that patients have been able to not only get rid of the depression symptoms, but also start to function back to their normal selves. Uh, almost 60% were able to gain full remission versus 14% in the group of patients who were given the inactive comparator. <laughs> yeah, some of the patients really were happy with um, <laughs> the group that they were randomized to and others were not. When you look at early termination, I mean, in the past studies, you know, who, people who ran the studies um, would express um, despair that, you know, they weren't able to get people to complete the full course of the trial. Well, as you can tell, patients who were receiving the active treatment were able to complete the full course of the trial. Patients who were receiving the inactive could not finish the full course. One third had to drop out, and that makes a lot of sense. I don't know if that actually it's such a problem. We have to measure dropout, if dropouts are really such a big problem. And I have very good statisticians at um, University of Pittsburgh to help us sort of ensure that these are, um, um, that the dropouts are appropriate. Okay, so let's go down one more. Um, so I wanted to show you the, the side effects. The side effects and the safety were also important to look at because anytime we introduce a new treatment, it needs to be um, it needs to be safe. It needs to be tolerable, and the range of side effects were very limited. In fact, most of the side effects that patients endorsed at the beginning of the trial seemed to have improved by the end of the trial. 
Importantly, we wanted to make sure that suicidality um, did not worsen and that patients were getting better, and we didn't um, separate the suicide effects in either group yet, but overall it looked like one in four patients came in with some suicidal thoughts, and one in 10 finished the study with some suicidal thoughts. We also had fun, we also um, wanted to characterize the um, changes in circadian rhythms, and we did so by examining um, people's sleep and activity levels. And we had patients wear uh, actigraphy watches for a period of 10 to 14 days throughout the beginning of the study and at the end of the study. And what we described were similar, not, not real big differences between the groups um, as yet um, in their activity levels, but we did find, or in their activity or their sleep levels, but what we did find is that when patients are more active during the day and have increased daytime activity, the sleep quality is much better. So in the course of the study, this is how NARSAD is coming, is providing help for me to continue this investigation because in the course of the study, we encountered an intriguing and unexpected finding. Well, what did we find? We um, enrolled patients who, who um, had basically normal eye function. And in fact, in the first study, in the preliminary trial, we had to undergo, have the patients undergo a whole slew of um, safety exams, including um, two to three hour eye exams to ensure that we weren't introducing detrimental eye effects um, to the patients. And the visual testing in the first study actually indicated that patients had reduced sensitivity to contrast. And this, is, this means that they had sen reduced sensitivity to light-dark transitions and were not able to perceive images or patterns with a dim or washed out appearance. And this is an example of the chart that we present to patients and test them on before and during the study. And the differences in perception between patients and healthy controls were large enough to suggest the reduction in contrast sensitivity was not a random finding. In fact, um, the standard, the z-scores were three, so it was a very big difference between controls and um, patients. And the poor contrast sensitivity could suggest different things, possibly impairment in the neural ophthalmic network, which processes visual photic input or visual input in general, to allow patients to perceive and adapt to the visible environment. In an outpatient clinic, other, other clinicians, um, in fact, these were ophthalmologists who studied uh, vision responses in depressed patients reported that the patient's um, experiences as surroundings also um, were unusually dim, and they reported this far more frequently than patients who did not have depression. There have been other studies that have looked at recordings of visual evoke potentials and electrical uh, activity in the retina that also indicated that having major depression was associated with lower responses in the visual cortex and the retina to displays of visual contrast, such as the ones that we um, display here, or other um, lab um, displays, and we were really intrigued by the findings from colleagues from elsewhere. And this is an example of, of what happens when a person, I don't know if you can see the animation, this is what happens when we receive photic input, it travels from the retina along the optic nerve through the lateral geniculate down to the visual cortex. And I probably need to finish in a, in a minute or two, but I want to explain to you how NARSAD will help us in a, right now. Okay, I'll just finish right now. So the next, I will not, i just, oh, yeah. So this is how NARSAD will help us. Um, to develop the study, we will build the next trial um, by continuing the clinical um, trial to compare active versus inactive light responses. And here in this study, we'll measure um, vision from retinal, but with measures of electro retinal um, activity and also measures of uh, visual evoke potentials. And in the future, we will work with other colleagues to assess the changes that could um, come about from um, mood in, from inducing um, mood changes and examining the brain in a more diffuse way. <laughs>